Um, uh, so yeah, if you were ready to start, so if you can take the last, yeah, or the last bit. <laughs> the beer and the bull wine and maybe some. We're gonna have networking after this yeah. as well, so. Yeah. Uh, Pablo, are we are we live? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, we're uh, we're uh, live streaming this, and uh, the talk is gonna be recorded and gonna stay on, on YouTube. Uh, the link is on Meetup. You can see it there. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is a joint meetup between uh, Major Starting Knights and Ladies Who Code. Thank you, Tammy, for uh, for helping with that. Um, I should start with the startups for the deck. Um, tonight we're going to have uh, Paula. She's going to talk about uh, collaborative teams, how to, how, why cross-functional teams are, uh, what are cross-functional teams, and why are they better than uh, uh, other ways to organize your team. Um, we are in the Totox office. Totox is kindly sponsoring this event. We are always hiring. Talk with uh, our lovely Amy or any of the Totoxers around. We are a couple of us. It's me, Fabi. Uh, so yeah, if you are interested, please talk with us. Um, we are always looking for feedback uh, and uh, any interesting uh, ideas we have for the for the event. Uh, we are looking also looking for speakers. So if you have something you want to talk about, be it for five minutes or hours, well, not hours, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for longer than five minutes, uh, we, we, we can accommodate that. So please feel free to contact, uh, to call, can talk on me, Pablo, or uh, Ivan Bamba. Um, so yeah, I'm going to let uh, Tammy know. Um, yeah, just uh, use the hashtags there oh, um, yeah, yeah. to tweet as well, tweet if you yeah. like the event and if you like us. Uh, and so, okay, so there's uh, food, I'm sure you all started with, and um, wine there as well. Uh, we also have some uh, things we're selling for charity, and some of the proceeds will go into charity to uh, Mustard Tree, which is a charity for uh, homeless people. And there's also a charity bot there, which, again, if you like to donate, whatever you like, you can put some donations in. We also have Tahira, who makes some really nice, arty uh, Christmas cards, which you can buy, um, which will be available after the talk as well. So I'll put you over to Paula now, who is uh, a business analyst for us in ThoughtWorks, and she works in cross-functional teams, and is going to talk us uh, talk to us about collaborating and working in cross-functional teams. Yeah, okay, yes. Paula, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so hi, yeah, I'm Paula, um, and I'm an analyst here at ThoughtWorks, and um, would like to talk to you about cross-functional teams. So, um, firstly, can I ask how many people uh, work in software delivery in the room? Hands up. Cool. How many people are in an agile environment? Awesome. And how many people would say they work in a cross-functional team? Cool. Who's got no idea what a cross-functional team is? <coughs> All right, okay, that's cool, right, we're a good, good start. Okay, so what is a cross-functional team? So basically, um, it's a group of specialists. So a group of skills, and you get all those skills together in a team, um, and they, they do stuff. Um, because I work in software development, and so does a lot of people in the room, um, quite often you will work with skills around business analysis, design, developing code, uh, quality analysis, and um, product owners as well. So um, the, the domain experts for the business that you're, you're working with. Um, and you put all those people together and you have a cross-functional team. So is this, is this enough? So I just wanna run a very quick exercise to uh, hopefully prove a point. So can I uh, just, I'm going to put you, you three at the front. Um, I'm going to ask you to draw something. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and um, don't panic, don't panic. And you are going to um, show your drawing to the person next to you. And you are going to describe what you see and you're going to ask the person next to you to then draw that. And we're going to look at what we come up with, okay? So it shouldn't take very long. So here's pen, here's pen. So I'll just whisper what you need to draw. Okay. 
just like waiting music or something. Some game shows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't write the words or anything, just write the words. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so without showing this to the person who's having to, let's take this away. So, and without saying any of the words around what you think you're. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay, so kind of describe, say well, what you so. see, but without using, you know, the actual item in which you think is wrong. Okay. Uh, it's like a curled piece of wire, okay. maybe, uh, and some means of getting from one floor to another um, piece of wire that is curled is descending, so it means of getting from one floor to another. Perfect. Okay, and now what do you think you have just drawn? What is it? A spring. Okay, cool. Right, so thank you very much. That was it. Round of applause. <laughs> so what I asked our first volunteer, sort of volunteer, um, to draw whoops, um, was a slinky. Okay, so we have a slinky. And what we ended up with was a spring, right? <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is that you can have three people in a team working together to try and um, create something. But if you just have one person talking to one person, then that person talks to the next person, who knows what you're going to end up with. It might be rather kind of similar, but it's not necessarily going to be exactly what you set out to achieve. So is putting all these skills together enough to say that you have a cross-functional team? This might be a common problem that some people recognize. It wasn't part of the story. So Dev hands over to the QA, and uh, the QA says, oh, did you think about this? They said, oh, no, it wasn't part of the story. Um, another problem you might recognize, blockers. So something's in Dev, and you realize you can't actually proceed because you, you need this thing to, to move forward. Another issue, someone goes away, maybe the analyst, uh, story gets picked up, it's not quite clear why you're doing what you're doing, something gets built, analyst comes back, that wasn't what we needed, it's not solving the real problem. And that story is huge, so it sits in dev for a very long time, and, uh, and you have a roadblock, and your cycle time goes crazy, and you can't predict what you're doing, and that, uh, that has a very negative effect on what you're trying to deliver. So all of these problems, um, obviously they create waste, and that we all know that that waste equals cost. Um, so just to put people together with different skills in a team isn't necessarily um, enough to make sure you avoid these problems. Um, those were all actually like real life examples from people that have cross-functional teams in an agile environment. So clearly it's not necessarily enough. So that's quite a cool quote uh, to show that it's a little bit more than just having those skills together and you need to break out of your silo. So Hi. let me introduce to you the Amigos. Yes. I disagree with that. Cool. <laughs> that's great. Okay, yeah, go. The functional team, the team members will each be able to do each other's job rather than that definition there which says that the entire assemblage the team has all the skills in it to do the job. Okay, um, so sorry, you're, so you say a cross-functional team is... Team members who themselves are multifunctional. Okay, so I, I re that's possibly one way of looking at it, but um, so from my experience of working with cross-functional teams, we tend to actually have those specialists that work uh, with one particular skill that they're really, really good at, um, and, and then we all come together as uh, a collective, if you like, and we collaborate. So rather than having one person that can do everything um, or a few people that can do lots of everything together um, from just from my experience um, I've worked with people that actually have those specialist skills and think about the this example here the amigos um, if you think we have a designer we have a dev QA and an analyst you then have the opportunity for people that really specialize in their field and they can advocate fully um, for their their, their expertise 
I'm happy to keep talking. Okay, no, after. I'll yeah, yeah. The cool. Thank you. Um, so, you know, a dev shouldn't just be siloed to code. Uh, QA is not necessarily a gatekeeper of quality. Um, the BA shouldn't just be the person you go to for answers when it comes to the business. Um, and a designer isn't just someone that hands over a, a design. Um, and if we come back to these problems, so um, this isn't part of the story. Um, if you have these different specialists and they, they come together early on, you can balance all those different needs that um, ultimately a, a problem that you're trying to solve um, needs. So this is a nice example of a product owner saying we need all these new shiny sparkly things and then you have um, a QA saying well actually wait a minute what about if it rains if you thought about that. So rather than keeping these two separate at the sort of very ends of the, the flow, if you bring them together quite early on and get them talking, you can try and make sure that you, you balance those requirements and come to a solution that, 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 that works for lots of different scenarios. So the other problem, um, blockers. If you can realize those blockers before you actually commit anything to code, um, you're going to solve, save lots of time and eliminate waste. So the BA isn't necessarily going to know the full technical requirements. Uh, and they're not necessarily going to know how the, uh, the integration or any dependencies and stuff that happens from a technical point of view, they're not necessarily going to have that full understanding. So if you can get the BA talking with the developer before something goes to code, you can hopefully realize some of these problems and, and, uh, and get those blockers cleared before you actually commit any effort to something that's not going to be <coughs> thrown away. Um, so the issue with if you lose a member of your team, so if you want to, one of your skills goes away. Um, again, if you pull in different members of the team and those different skills early on, you are going to make sure that it's not just you that holds that understanding. It's not just one person that understands why the business needs something. Um, and you're all going to have that understanding of why you're choosing to solve a problem where you're solving it and understand why you've decided to do something the way you're doing it. So no one is just relying on one person to have the answer. And, um, and yeah, <laughs> you're all going to be able to answer questions relatively well yourselves. Um, and that story was an extra large. So if we think about story sizing, um, if you can get your... Um, estimation accurate, you're going to get really good cycle times. Um, you're going to get that value quicker to users if you can try and make sure your stories are small. So again, an, an analyst isn't necessarily going to know everything that you need to know in order to slice a story. Um, your designer might have a really uh, cool idea on how to slice it as far as what you should give your users first. Um, your devs are going to have a great idea about the technical responsibilities and, and how you could potentially slice those. And if you can just really understand your the the sizes of the jobs that you're that you have at hand, um, then again you can estimate, you can ask for investment, you can be reliable. So there are some tools and techniques that personally I've used and um, can help with cross-functional teams. Uh, Kanban is um, a great tool for visualizing that flow. So uh, you can pull people out of um, you can pull the the QA over to A and D, and you can you can really, without going into too much detail about Kanban, when it's used correctly, it's a fantastic tool to aid this kind of uh, structure. And pairing. So we all know that uh, developers um, pair program is not so common for analysts to pair. It's very rare that you get a couple of BAs on a project from the idea of um, sharing skills. Um, so try and pair. Personally, for me, um, depending on the type of problem we're trying to solve, I will always pair either with um, our um, user experience designer or with our quality analyst, um, because I just I, I can't think of everything as an analyst. And um, lo-fi prototyping as well. If you're trying to involve lots of different skills, you can't necessarily um, expect everyone to uh, deliver something to a certain um, level that's you know, everyone can understand. So if you get people scribbling and you start um, just 
drawing out flows and ideas. They can easily be thrown away. You're not committing very much, and it's really, really accessible. So anyone with any skills can can um, use this as a tool. And basically, just try and ideate as a team. So rather than thinking that it's down to the designer or the analyst to come up with the specification, if you like, and then it's just up to the developer to develop it and the and the QA to make sure that it you know meets all the um, the edge cases. You know, bring everyone together really early on. But it does come with some warnings. This way of working, um, managers versus makers schedule. So managers tend to have lots of meetings, lots of context switching. Uh, makers, they need that creative space. So obvious difference here is if you look at a BA compared to a dev. So you need to be really uh, sensitive to that and not necessarily just pull everyone all, in all the time. You need to know who to speak to and when to speak to them. And of course, meetings. Um, if you're a cross-functional team, it's not necessarily an excuse to have your entire team in a meeting when you're trying to talk about um, some upcoming problems. Um, developers, time is really valuable. Um, designers, again, really valuable, really expensive. If you have people in a room and they don't need to be there, that's really, really costly. So all of this is just basically alluding to mixing it up, right? And there's clearly different opinions on um, how this can work, and let's hope we can have a conversation about that. That would be cool. Um, but if you try and share different expertise in a team and share that knowledge, um, then you can start to collaborate and understand the problem to unblock and just try and realize that value fast. And that's it. Thank you. If there are any questions. No, but I buy into your definition, actually. I've been thinking about cross-functional team members. Oh, OK. Which is advantageous in the scenario where, say, the business analyst goes away. If you have someone else who can do business analysis, yeah. they can prevent the block of going on particular tasks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there are different environments where maybe, um, you know, there's lots of talk in the analysis world of um, um, uh, sort of user experience unicorns is, is something that's come up recently where, you know, people, they have all these different skills and they do understand lots of different uh, phases of a product cycle. Um, but then on the on the flip side, there's some people that say, well, if you're a generalist, how are you actually going to be a specialist? And sometimes certain projects and certain tasks actually require those specialists. And I don't at all disagree that you can, you know, you can have a consultant particularly um, with lots of multiple skills that cross lots of different um, um, domains, if you like. Um, but yeah, I think it, it depends on on the, on the problem that you have, and, and certainly this 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 can prove quite. I think effective. it's easier to get cross-functional team members in the technical area. So, for example, if you've got a a rails dev, and um, you've got a shortage of people who to write copy script, for example, in your team, you can pair, you can pair a rails dev with a copy script developer, get a transfer of skills, create someone who themselves is cross-functional, and thereby. Mm ease the progress of work through your pipeline. Yeah, yeah. But I think maybe doing a jump from a user interface designer to a developer or vice versa is mm. what I want. Yeah. <coughs> we have an example around, please. <laughs> <laughs> we have a UX unicorn. Yeah. Uh, Ignacio here. He's going to skip Yeah, well, I mean, I can see transition from dev to UX. So I have some uh, background content on on the dev area, and I used to pair and also. So then it's not about, about pairing, but it's about being involved in the conversation and having a, another head just to think and and, and get different solutions. Because when you're some uh, sometimes working on some, on something, you just have one pair of eyes, and having a, a new one is very very helpful. Cool. Uh, yeah. So um, at different times in my life, done QA or dev, and it's hard to do both at the same time because you're either in a constructive mindset or a deconstructive mindset. So try to be the one person thinking about how it'll, you know, the happy path and the edge cases, you tend to miss a lot of things. So I find that I can do one job well at any one time. And so doing what Paula's talking about, <clears throat> having all those different perspectives around a table, debating, uh, defending their, their part of the, the cause, um, tends to be really valuable because people are more specialists versus everybody trying, each person trying to do everything. Mm, okay, I had no problem putting on different hats, but 
Yeah, maybe. But I'm saying if you're trying to do it all in, in one go, like if I can. Yeah, that's your point. Is, uh, you get murdered into a particular way of being because of what you've done for the last two days or something. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I think um, back in the day, 15 years ago, you had a lot of people that you probably would now describe as full stack developers because there was less people doing it. You had, you had to provide more coverage as an individual. I think what's happened over the last 15 years is these each layer of the stack has become fatter, there's been more technology in each, and you've required people to become more specialists. So what I think you find in development is people that provide coverage. Uh, they provide coverage for a specific area, and it sort of bleeds out into other areas. And I think you can extend that analogy to UX, design, QA, VA, product, anything, delivery, lead, you know, project management. And I think the crucial point is within the group of people that are working as a team, you have to have adequate coverage across all these areas to do what you want to do. And I think that coverage depends upon what you're trying to do and it reflects the change and the projects. Um, so coverage is, is, is the way that I would describe it. Yeah. Coverage across your team. Yeah, and I think um, one thing that I didn't necessarily call out fully here is that um, obviously I focused on the roles quite early on, um, but if we think about it more about skills, as you say, you know, you need to look at the problem you're trying to solve and, and think about the different skills that you need. And I think that, that links quite nicely to this idea of coverage, you know, making sure that you, you have the, the right tools to solve that problem effectively and get them talking at the right time. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> just over interest, have you ever done <coughs> functional teams with distributed uh, development sites? Because I have funds between Texas and India mm. and find it a nightmare. Yeah. My testing team who are don't really understand but don't not really wanting to participate. Okay. Have you experienced that? Yeah, I've had some experience. Um it yeah, it is a bigger challenge. Um I find that I mean if you know, if the people who are um in another place are not kind of, you know, keen, then that's gonna that's a different challenge, I think. But as far as distributors, um I've just made sure that it's sensitive to time differences. So again, you know, thinking about people's schedules that they have to fit in a day, um, think about when to speak to them. Um, it just takes a, a little bit more forward planning. And of course, it's not as effective as if you're all in the same room and you can just go, oh, hang on a minute, can we quickly have a conversation at lunchtime, for example. Um, but um, yeah, it comes with different challenges, but we've, we've gone some way to making it work and it does, it takes dedication from the, the, from the entire team. There are tools that make uh, <clears throat> makes the distribution, uh, the communication better. As in, uh, if you have all all the team members in a in a chat, or we are using a tool called Squiggle, where it's like a virtual office. If uh, someone from outside wants wants to talk to you, it just clicks and the you, you don't have you don't have to accept. It just pops up and you you hear. So there are tools out there. Uh, it's not ideal. It, it, it uh, you can see impact on performance, but if you have to do it, you, you can make make the experience better. And I have testers who have amnesia. Oh, okay. As in, they, they tested something six months ago and they can't actually remember how to do it, and they need yeah. hand holding to the point is that they send you screenshots back to you asking you whether or not this is correct. Yeah, which is a bit worrying as a developer. Yeah. You, 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 usually, it's always going to be correct. <laughs> yeah. Usually, you. Yeah. Sorry. Relying on automation would help more with, with that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I can only really speak of my experience from more on the analysis side. So, um, I think it probably comes with very different challenges if you know if you're more on the sort of technical technical side of things. So. Yeah. I was going to ask if you've got, well, I'm not sure if you're bound to answer it, but if you've got any examples of projects where you've started using this and it's seen outcomes that you wouldn't have expected otherwise, or yeah, uh, or um, the, just the general, general smooth. Thing. Yeah, so um, the, an interesting one around if the analyst um, disappears, so if you've got these different silos and then suddenly one of those is unavailable. Um, so um, this was a colleague's experience, so I wasn't the, the analyst. Um, but um, yeah, so the analyst went away. 
and they picked up a story and without going into too much details because it's kind of sensitive um there was a certain interaction that they didn't quite understand and they were like well, why why are we executing it this way and then the client found um a mock-up that was um created like three four months prior to that story actually being played and they said well we much prefer this mock-up so why don't we do it this way and the whole team were like oh yeah it's cool yeah this looks much better let's do it so they spent nearly a week um on this story um and then the ba came back and was like well hang on a minute that's not what i asked you to do why have you done that and basically the the mock-up they found was created three months prior to that business requirement really being explored and then it wasn't actually solving the problem at all so they had to just scrap the story and i mean that was one example this was happening time and time again so what actually happened was um one of the the developers um stood up and was like okay look let's let me be more involved in the analysis and um and and, and so far it's been a success and i think early on there was quite a lot of investment that had to be made from from this this dev particularly um so there was a sacrifice on dev time but it was an investment made on trying to avoid that waste when the story actually comes through the cycle and um and so he's been able to step away a bit now because it's it's kind of you know the proof was in the pudding and they're kind of on board so I'm like all right fine yeah we need to make sure we speak to more people um but it's one example, That's a good example. yeah <laughs> Yeah, and do your cost structure teams include um, ops in front of people? Is there enough work for them to be kept in that team? For uh, yeah, so um, I don't know if you would mind me pointing to my <laughs> colleague here, he's probably the best <laughs> equipped to answer that. Yeah, yeah. We, it's something we really want to do. We've been thinking more about what are, the, what are new amigos. So, BA, QA, UX, uh, that was going really well. We said, okay, ops, security experts, like we'd imagine like lots of different people who might have an interesting perspective on the stories that we're playing. Um, one of the problems is uh, time sharing. So uh, like our UX people, there aren't that many of them. So we've split them between projects. Well, our security and ops people, you can split, split them further. So when there are things like, um, you know, what, how, how can we integrate cloud into our internal, you know, um, with internal hosted systems, that sort of thing, uh, we know that they're going to have an opinion on it. So we'll call one of them up and um, see if we can involve them in defining acceptance criteria. Uh, so it's not every card. Uh, we don't have them full time by any means, but over the long term, ThoughtWorks would like to uh, decentralize our ops uh, team uh, as consultants to kind of just run projects and help help with that sort of thing. Is there not a thing where we kind of bring ops people in if they're particularly a stakeholder in a piece that we're doing? They are generally the people that keep your infrastructure up yeah. are a significant stakeholder in the systems that you're running. So in those in those sprints, we tend to bring them in as part of the team. But obviously, again, they all split across a lot of yeah. a lot of systems, so we can't do it all the time. But just when they're really going to have that impact. Yeah. No, it has, it's really helpful. And what's interesting, you go to a lot of client sites, and they, you know, they tend to uh, separate their teams in very siloed fashion. So the opposite of what Paul is talking about is, you know, there is an integration team, there is a Linux team, there is a Windows team, there is a firewall team, there is a database team, there is a, you know. Uh, I, I've been at one client where was, I think every single component of the computer had a, had a team, you know? And uh, the problem was all these teams have different sets of priorities. And so then that, that person who's the expert at maintaining an Oracle database all of a sudden becomes a bottleneck. When instead if you use them as all as consultants, you know, this person's a networking expert, this person's a database expert, this person's a uh, you know, security expert. If you let them consult on cross-functional teams and help them uh, to achieve the ends that they care about, then they all of a sudden are an enabler and not an academic. Another model we're using, well, <laughs> it's pretty similar with what uh, Chris described in the website on Toto.com team is that um, we are taking care of our infrastructure ourselves, as in we are creating the servers, we are provisioning them, we are applying security updates to them. Um, <clears throat> And that's, that can be very tricky because you can today work with Puppet and tomorrow work with CSS. Uh, that stretches us a lot. Uh, but it, it's very good because if we need something, we don't rely on someone else. We don't, expect, uh, don't wait for someone to uh, uh, come back to our, to our emails and have that delay of communication and uh, trying to get them up to speed. That being said, we still need help, as in, uh, when we encounter security problems, we have our security folks who are like, 
mailing them, get them in, on a on a Skype chat and uh, uh, asking for advice. So. Again, if you treat them as consultants, yeah. take some of their knowledge yeah. into the team. Yeah. In the same way that you're starting to take some of the infrastructure stuff into the team. Yeah. That's a, a way to go there and try and remove some of that bottom again. Yeah. Yeah. So it depends a lot of your your team, what your skills because uh, depends not on what you want to, to build because these kind of teams are yeah. it's, it's hard for developers to and if we can try and get I mean the 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 point that would be great to get to is if you know think about all this even before the project before you start delivering stuff, like before the team is put together, if we can really try and understand those skills that are needed, because more often than not, you know, you're 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 put in a job because I mean, I'm speaking from a point of view as a consultant, of course. Um, you know, you're put in a team because you are a business analyst. Whereas if you kind of broke all that down and it was just about skills, then hopefully more of this stuff would um, would start happening more organically. So, I've got a mini rant, perhaps. No, no, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Both ways, I'd love to engage you, please. Um, so we all know that the, the length of time the problem goes unsolved, the more expensive it becomes to fix. And for the last seven years or so, I've been repeatedly hitting a situation where developers don't do any kind of quality assurance activities around the code that they've just written. So they might be working in some kind of test-first paradigm. Um, and they might have, for example, great aspect tests, but the, the tests in Gherkin might be a bit lacking. Um, they may have made them up without any, any help from an analyst. Um, but to do a thorough development job, if I was being a thorough developer, I would at least exercise the code in the area where I've been developing that code. Um, to try and prevent the code getting out and then having a, a problem which is detected via QA a week down the line it comes back to me and I've got to reconstruct all my arguments and thought processes and so on. So you talked earlier about getting into a particular mode of being. Um, if you're developing then being a developer and not doing any QA activity. And so actually I'm asking you in possibly the entire room, what is it about developers which prevents them from actually using the system which they are. You're shaking your head. Yeah, what have you got to say? You, I'll tell you if you, one of the things that you want to do in a cross-functional team is you want, as a leader of a cross-functional team, is you want to have the team feeling accountable to each other. Right? So you need to build that. You know, we all... Oh, there's no lack of accountability yeah. in these situations. <laughs> but yeah. I, 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 personally, because I, I don't particularly develop anymore, as I say, what I used to, I would always do that. I always encourage the, the, the developers in my teams to do that constantly because one of the things is I kind of built up this thing, you know, you don't want to be giving somebody rubbish. Indeed. So I, I think agree. you just need to make... When you're developing, you've written the code. You know it's how part it works. Of the... You know how it works. You, 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 you wouldn't do things that would break it. Well, you, you know how it works. You know how it works. Yeah. 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 So, um, so there's a different, a different scale. There's a lot pride in it, isn't there? Yeah. And I think collaborating might just make it a little bit better for you as a developer to maybe think about those cases you didn't think about before when you were just trying to solve a problem just by yourself. So you were doing an Amigos before you start working on a story and you have a QA uh, and a BA or, or a BA talk to you about edge cases. So when you're developing that, you're quite early on thinking about those edge cases as opposed to, you know, struggling alone to think about all those and then maybe at the end of it, you've got a higher quality uh, I'll, I'll user story. i what you're saying, but yeah. I will also say that some edge cases only become apparent in complex applications. Some edge cases only become apparent once the code has been written. Yeah, and and, and it's and obviously uh, that it's good to actually tackle them and not say uh, we'll leave it for the QA to find out that obviously because that's not a good idea anyway, is it? So, so we won't say that I'll do defensive programming. Do they not do any handovers? Uh, yeah, I know there's handovers. I suppose handovers is also hand part of your collaboration more even, yeah, so isn't we, it? So we don't allow the code to go in unless it's been handed over, so we allow the QA to come onto the machine and check what's mm -hmm. on there, and then they have a play around in that area, and for that to be merged in 
it's part of the acceptance of the work you aim for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm talking about detecting. I mean, you will detect errors at that stage. I'm talking about detecting errors much okay, closer so to when the code is written. Tests. Oh, they, they, no, they are doing unit <coughs> tests and they are doing behavioral tests. I think what is happening with the developer is only coping with what they know. Yes, I would agree to that. And I, I think that maybe the, what's actually happening is that the problem that they're trying to do. Sorry. It's okay, it's right. Come on. Um, what we've tried to do is we have a queue at the beginning. So if you involve the QA, the developer, the business has, if you've got one, the delivery, the stakeholders, you define the acceptance criteria. Then within your acceptance criteria, you will find most of your cases. There is something that's going to stay at the end, you know, the QA is going to catch, and that's why it's there. But if you have a discussion from the beginning with all the stakeholders, most of the acceptance criteria is going to be defined, creating the story. So when you actually develop it, it's going to be there. Mm. I take on everything you're saying. I will, I will advance the thing that we have done to break this evil cycle, and that is to get the entire team to swarm onto the system and attempt to break the system in the knowledge of their code um, uh, oh, I suspect that our code doesn't actually deal with such and such, let me try it now. And it becomes a distinct activity. And um, that does work, but again, it's too far away from the writing of the code from my life. One thing, I, so a while back, hold back, last year, I was, uh, it was okay. And uh, one thing I was trying to do, did manage to do so often was to pair on the story, on a story that was towards ready to finish so let's say a story was in play for two days and the developer says that ah it's almost there i'll be like okay i want to pair in this story and uh because in pairing that the developer was describing to me what he'd done and i'm uh, like chris was saying i'm using my i'm trying to use my destructive uh mindset to to break it down so it is basically trying to like you said tr trying to br bring that uh that mindset that uh, way of thinking from outside as early as possible so it, it worked okay but uh, yeah it, it, it needs uh, as a QA you need to de decide what you want to do because there are lots of things you can do so yeah and I think, I don't, oh, sorry go on I've done enough talking <laughs> so thinking again about um, sort of building more T-shaped people have you tried actually getting Developers to sort of walk in the QA shoes for a while, maybe for a sprint or something, and actually just try taking on that different mindset. For a That's an interesting idea. You mean signing for this particular iteration? Yeah, signing uh, someone to an unfamiliar role. between the developer and the tester. Mm. Yeah, that could, work. that could work. So we have. Sorry, I was just thinking, if it's if it's a scenario where it requires like user input, then you can always use the uh, random data in your tests, and then you that would generate like things that you might normally not think about, and that might pick up some. Yeah, I'm, I don't know. If... Yeah, and, and without knowing, you know, the the full context of the problem that you're having, um, you know, you you can replicate the outcome of you know what you're developing um in the form of you know rapid prototypes or um depending on how much risk you're putting on this this thing that you're putting to code you know if you if you're thinking about uh, possible things that are going to break it then you know maybe we've done before as far as like this sort of agile design process you, know, you create a prototype that that you're just going to get out straight away and test and then learn from that to help drive exactly how you're going to develop yeah, and solve the problem but I mean that doesn't address the final problem of those edge cases which sneak through the development. Yeah, as, as, I mean there's always yeah. Yeah, make sure can't, can't be perfect. Finished, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. Would reducing the time between you finishing and the test of picking up not help because a week's. Oh uh, yeah, I'm sure we're today. experimenting with that right now. Yeah. So, <coughs> the code. Do your developers do test driven development? Yes. Do they really do test? <laughs> <laughs> what you can do is you can have one developer write the test as a as a task on the board, and not until that is done does another developer pick up writing the code. So then the person writing the test is focusing on the edge cases because that's what they're doing when they're writing the test. So if you're one developer and you've been asked to write the tests in the code, you'll do test code, test code, and you're not thinking about the edge cases as much as if you set that aside. Mm -hmm. Possibly a rather bold statement, but I think you've probably got some more fundamental problems <laughs> that developers don't like doing at the time. 
sounds to me like possibly there's some issues there around experience, some issues around leadership, some issues around expectation. Um, so we adjust and some of them things might mean that it gives the developers a little freedom to do the things that they need to do to become experts, rather than expecting to be experts from day one by imposing lots of rigor on them. No, 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 the developers get a very free hand in our just um, and they are amazingly good, so I'm going to deny both of those. <laughs> 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 could be me, could be me, but um, I think what needs to happen is a little bit of shuffling around the board in terms of what happens at what stages and the time criteria. That's impossible. Perhaps. Perhaps, yeah. Sure. Paul, oh, any more? Comments or questions? Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as our, our particular team, the way we deal with it, uh, it's like what you're talking about. Um, the handoffs are really important. Um, so Preeti uh, comes over and does a desk check before anybody can call their code complete. So first off, in the edge cases, most of those have been defined through this cross-functional discussion. So we've we've had a discussion with the product owner and everybody. These are all the thing, ways we can think of it can go wrong. And then they say, oh, but well, we don't care about these two. Great, we remove those. Those all become tests, right? Developers have to demonstrate that all those acceptance criteria have been encoded as tests. Uh, most of the other is going to be relegated to the undefined behavior bin, and uh, she'll do a desk check. <clears throat> desk check is I'm going to try to play around with the edge cases here, uh, see if I can do anything to break it before the developers have context shifted the way you talked about. Um, if they can't find anything right off, then it goes from uh, dev done to QA in progress. Uh, and then she'll try to do a deeper dive with exploratory testing. Um, she'll usually find like one, two things or something, and then uh, has the developers switch back to that to fix it, but it's usually something small. Uh, and then she's happy with it, she pushes the button up there that says go live to production. It goes. So we, because we shifted, you know, you talked about the earlier you address quality, the cheaper it is. That's totally true. So rather than asking her late and getting a defect, we ask early, we can accept this criteria. We ask again before we hand off the context switch, uh, so that we can the developers can cheaply course correct, and we, you know, the end stage when she's doing the deep exploration, that's for things that we missed in the acceptance criteria. Um, so there's very little left by the, that end there, and then it can just go. Um, if somebody has a better flow, mm -hmm. happily enough. Yeah. <laughs> but so it, it's the test actually test all those scenarios in the acceptance criteria before showing it to the QA. So that is one out of testing which they have to do because otherwise. It's but during the handoff, if I if a QA sees that one of the acceptance criteria is not working, then we ask the devs to work on that right there. And then mm. we sort of expect it out of them to at least test all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not just like uh, just code reviews as well, just between devs or the commit because so like code abuse did you say? Yeah. <laughs> because, well it, it it's got other benefits of kind of helping to share the knowledge of what people are working on and kind of Giving each type of kind of broad length knowledge across your code base. Explain code code abuse, code. please. Code reviews. Oh, reviews. So I thought you said code abuse. <laughs> 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 Maybe we've stumbled upon a new technique. We're talking about that next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 as well, obviously. I was just going to say very quickly back to what you said in your presentation pairing. So a test of pairing with an app. Mm. Just to guide them as they're sure, sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, I've worked recently on a team that was quite on the other end of the spectrum, not very collaborative at all. And we all worked as consultants and experts in our own area, trying to provide a service to this thing called the project. And that didn't work very well for many reasons. For minimum viable product, there was none because we never got our priorities to align together like the DBAs would be working on a separate thing and the designers would be working on a separate thing. And I mean, that led to whole other issues and that's completely at the other end of the spectrum. But just to kind of add to the fact that if you want to talk about lean and you want to talk about MVPs, you want to think about how you can get all the teams to align priorities and work together as one team rather than, you know, separate parts of a team. I think maybe this discussion is kind of, you know, been a nice demonstration of that you know I haven't been able to answer all the questions I'm here advocates for what Chris knows and then we have pretty advocating over there and it's yeah so uh, yeah real life example to maybe yeah I, I can sit down now if people want to just <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm having a good the camera on me but uh, yeah
Cool. All right. Yeah. 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 Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. No, it's okay. Uh, yeah, feel free to.